So today on the podcast, we have Ray McCormack, my father, special guest today. And the very first guest, this is the first podcast, might not be the first episode, but it's going to be the first podcast we actually record. So welcome, Ray. Oh, well, thank you. I guess I'm the second person you saw when you were born. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So today, the first thing we want to get into is the first job you had. Oh, Well, the first job that I had was actually a newspaper route over in England. A little different than newspapers uh, routes that you have here in the States. In the fact that um, there's about uh, four or five different newspapers, daily newspapers that you could have. And you couldn't just throw it on the porch because it rained all the time over there. So everybody over in England had what they call a letterbox on the front door. So you'd have to get off your bike, run up to the door, and take the right newspaper and stick it in the stick it in the front door. Most of them were too big to actually slide in like a letter, so they'd be hanging out. But people would get up in the morning and uh, notice that the paper was in the stuck in the front door. Yeah. So it took a little longer to do that. It does here. Yeah, it blew me away. I mean. In Salt Lake City, I think they had two newspapers, the Tribune and the Desert News. <laughs> and, kids just, and I think they were delivered at different times of the day. So anyway, so it's completely different. Yeah. So I didn't really know how good a worker I was at the time until I got promoted in that job. Um, and uh, really, a good worker was he show up every day. You were, you didn't call in sick. He just did you route, and uh, and you got paid once a week. And um, <clears throat> but I got promoted. And what that meant is I had to get up another hour earlier before school. And um, each route, you would pull the papers in a, in a certain order, so that the kid that uh, was delivering the papers didn't really have to think which is good at that time in the morning <laughs> when you're half asleep. And so, in other words, the papers would be in order of the route. You'd go to certain houses and you'd pull out the next newspaper and you'd stick it in the letterbox. And um, so I got promoted. I got up and I was pulling routes for others. And then, I would, uh, and then I'd go deliver my route. <clears throat> and then I'd go to school. Yeah. And so... Uh, and then I, I kind of moved on. My, uh, my dad uh, was uh, the managing director of a, uh, a brick company, manufactured concrete bricks. And I would work there on holidays away from school through the summer, uh, any, any chance I could to get money. And uh, What age were you during that time? Let's see, I would have been, uh, I would have been about 15. And, um, and so they, uh, they got a machine, it was just a hand-operated machine, that would crack the face of the concrete brick and it would, uh, it would look like stone when you, instead of a perfectly formed brick, you would crack, uh, you know, the face of it. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, that was piecework. And so uh, I could go there on a Saturday morning and make more money on a Saturday morning than I could delivering papers and pulling papers every day, seven days a week. So I gave him uh, a month's notice and uh, he wanted me to stay, but he couldn't couldn't afford to pay me that kind of money. And I really liked that because I liked to drive things and I got to scrape up all the scrap from the bricks I was basically chipping and then I got to drive this uh, diesel dumpster and I was you know 15 years old thought that was great <laughs> still like to drive to drive things do you remember um, how much money you were making back then you know I cannot remember I moved on from there when I uh, graduated from basically what you would call high school here to a job uh, as an apprentice engineer. So to become an, an engineer in England, 
you have to have the practical background. In other words, you cannot design something that can't be made. So I went and worked for a company called Merle's Blackstone that um, <clears throat> made huge diesel engines. I mean massive, mainly for power plants. These pistons were probably two feet around and three feet high, each piston. And uh, I, I learned a lot in that job. And I made four pounds, ten, and three pence. I was hoping you were going to say something like that. <laughs> I didn't want it to be two dollars an hour. <laughs> that a week, yeah. four pounds, ten, and three pence. It would come in an envelope and had a little cutout so you could count the the bills, and then it had holes in the envelope so you could see if they had the right change in there. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. That's that's uh, you know. I mean, that was back in uh, I was back in the sixties. Yeah, you know, the late sixties. Do you know what that would have equated to in U.S. dollar? Well, um, that would have equated to about um, five or six dollars a week. Yeah. <laughs> really, I mean, uh, you couldn't sustain yourself on that. I had, to, I was living at home at that time, and um, anyway. Um, it, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, obviously, it's hard to gauge now, but uh, so I was making four pounds. Ten shillings is like half a pound. There's 20 shillings in a pound. Nowadays, a gallon of, a gallon of gas in England costs 10 pounds a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was making nothing. But uh, as an apprentice, the, you, that was known. But it was, uh, I mean, I've used those tools and things that I learned back then uh, in the industry I uh, eventually uh, got into. Yeah. And so. Do you remember the guys you used to work with at that place? Like the. It was bosses? a huge company, so it wasn't an individual. There were, as an apprentice engineer, you would wear brown overalls. So that they knew that you were nothing, <laughs> basically. <laughs> the rest of the company were, uh, wore blue overalls, and you graduate out of the apprentice portion um, after the first year. But it was, a, it was a fantastic education. Yeah. I mean, we made things like uh, precise vices. I mean, the threads, everything in a vice from s just scrap, from scrap, not scrap material, but scratch material. It's yeah. just basic material. You'd make the threads, you'd make the jaws, you'd case harden the jaws, and all those processes learned. Uh, and I was actually pretty good. I could quite understand the uh, uh, the way things work, the milling machines, the, uh, the lathes, uh, all of that kind of stuff. My friend... I uh, brought, uh, he had a uh, Range Rover, a uh, diesel one, and he wanted to uh, shave the head off of that. There was only one machine that could do that. It was called a shaper. And for some reason, I had a talent of sharpening uh, the tools so that uh, it would be smooth. And uh, he brought that engine in, asked him if he could do this, and uh, and uh, he said, yeah, get McCormack to do it. This was a huge machine. It had an electric, small electric motor to start the big electric motor. That's how big it was. Great education. So I was there uh, when I was 16 and 17, and then I emigrated to the United States when I was 18. Yeah. And were you so excited I left to move that to, to the U.S., or were you uh, <clears throat> like in your life in England at the time? Well, it was uh, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> I was excited to, to move to the U.S. My two old, older brothers stayed, but I was ready for a new adventure. And um, <clears throat> so I was really excited. Probably the main reason is being eight years old with a British accent, all I had to do is say hello to a girl, <laughs> order food at a drive-up, and it was an instant conversation of, oh, where are you from? 
Yeah. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was fantastic that way. Yeah. And, uh, and so Sean Connery was in his, uh, was in his prime. Yeah. <laughs> 1970 is when I immigrated over here. <clears throat> and so it was, uh, it was fantastic. And what I found out is uh, the United States completely different than Great Britain in the fact that you had class, you know, you had different classes of people in Great Britain. My passion was a, a draftsman. I had the ability to look at something and, uh, and put it down on paper. And when I went to a, uh, you know, the schools would put on these, uh, places that you could work and stuff like that. I told them I wanted to be a draftsman. And they said, well, I uh, don't think you, you're not in the right class. Don't think you'll ever be able to be a draftsman. I came over here <clears throat> and um, I wanted to get a degree. And so I went to Slick, Salt Lake Community College. I brought my drawings from England and uh, they went through my drawings. So for an associate's degree, they passed me off the first year. I said, you, you know, no point in you going through the first year. So one year of school, ended up with an associate's degree, degree basically in drafting. And I was working at the time at gas stations and a countertop place, but then I got my first job over here as a draftsman uh, for a company here in Salt Lake uh, called Wondor Corporation. That uh, that corporation uh, manufactured uh, um, uh, folding petitions that you see a lot of them. They're accordion petitions that will divide a room up into smaller places, yeah. uh, places, and then you can do that. Pretty cool. Well, one thing that's interesting, um, I'm going to ask you to touch on a little bit, is you know when you immigrated over here, my grandfather, your father, actually didn't come with you, so you were kind of the man of the house. Well, <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, my dad came over here for a business opportunity. He knew somebody over here that actually got him. He worked for him as the managing director of that brick company. He was one of the owners. He emigrated over to Salt Lake City. And they wanted to start a fish and chip franchise. So my dad came over here by himself to uh to get that business going and then uh, my mother and my younger sister stayed to sell the house and after he got that going uh, then i came over with my two younger brothers yeah, big flight over <laughs> <laughs> took a train to uh to london and then uh that's a whole story in itself. That was, uh, that was a little stressful. We, 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 he had booked us on a charter flight, and it, was, it didn't leave for six, seven, eight, nine hours after it was supposed to leave. All kinds of rumors going on. Anyway, I ended up uh, in Salt Lake City after we came to LAX, caught another flight, and uh, uh, they opened the doors. It was August. I remember that. They opened the doors, and they didn't have jetways then. They opened the doors. We walked down the stairway onto the asphalt and walked into the airport. Yeah. And I walked out of that door and thought, my gosh, this is an oven. <laughs> 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 Just not used to that kind of heat. Yeah. Not used to the altitude and not used to the, uh, to the dryness. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was the biggest flake known to man <laughs> my whole body just was just drying up yeah yeah coming from an island <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so so how do you think you uh, integrated into the united states you know was it easy to find a work back then was it you know friends <clears throat> well i didn't have any friends it was pretty lonely at first um i actually went to uh, the first friends i got were by going to church and um and met some friends that uh at church and then uh, my dad had this fish and chip shop right downtown salt lake city that was doing crazy well and uh so i was a bus boy there 
And, uh, you know, I met some of the girls that were working there as waitresses and stuff like that. Um, those are basically the only friends I had for a little bit. And the people at work, I never saw them outside work, really. And so I just remember one time going, <clears throat> driving home from work. And, um, and I drove down, I think it was North Salt Lake going uh, west. And uh, I could see all these girls playing, uh, I thought, baseball. So I stopped and pulled in, pull in, and I was fascinated, never seen anything like it. I mean, they, they were real athletes. They were playing softball. <clears throat> so they'd ball that, throw that ball under arm, and I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, they were nice-looking girls, so I just stayed there for a while watching them, and they were athletes. I was, uh, I was very impressed yeah. by that. But getting back to being the man of the house, yeah. We came over here, unbeknownst to me, on a visitor's visa. <clears throat> and so my dad applied for emigration while we were here. And uh, back in 1970, it was a lot different than it is now. And they said, you can't come into the country and apply for emigration. <laughs> yeah. And so, to cut a long story short, they basically kicked him out of the country. And so uh, he, I was the only how one. How long had he been living here at that point? Oh, probably nine months, yeah. maybe a year. Yeah. It's when he applied is when he put up the red flag. Or else we wouldn't have even known we were here. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, uh, so he left and went up to uh, Canada and uh, thought he could come over and see the family, but they wouldn't let him into the country. And, um, but anyway, you know, my dad's a, an adventurer. He's one of those guys that never looks backwards. He always looks forward. It's, yeah. a, I think, a great trait. Yeah. And uh, so I was the only one that would drive. My mother never drove. And so when you say I was the man of the house, I mean, um, you know. Anyway, when I graduated after a year and became a draftsman, um, you know, things started to open up for me because I was making quite good money for the time, actually. Yeah. And so uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah. How long was Grandpa out of the country for? I think he was out of the country for, uh, it's hard to remember, a year and a half to two years. Yeah, it was a while. Yeah. Yeah. To know your grandfather, I mean, he's a character. I mean, yep. <laughs> he, uh, <clears throat> He was um, up in Canada. He was all over Canada um, promoting movies. <clears throat> Call of the Wild, if I remember correctly. It's Charlton Heston, who was a big movie star back in that day. And so he decided he wanted to come home for Christmas. And he started on the uh, East Coast, Toronto, and went to the border and he got rejected. So he went to the, another border, got rejected, and he's working his, his way west. He finally got to Calgary, <clears throat> snowing, middle of the night, in a car. And uh, he said to the guy, look, <clears throat> he pulled out this Bible, and he said, I'll put my hand on this Bible. He said, oh, please let me into the country. I would like to see my family over Christmas. And he has his hand on the Bible. <laughs> And this guy, he says, uh, I will promise you I'll be back here in four days. And the guy said, I'll lose my job over this. Anyway, he convinced the guy. Yeah. And the guy said, I'll be here in four days. You better be here. Yeah. And so my dad, uh, you know, drove down to Utah, I mean, a lot of miles, winter time, and uh, showed up for Christmas and said, hey, I've got to go back promised this guy would be back at his, on his shift on yeah. wherever the day was. I think it was four days. I, hard to remember those small details, but it was great to see my dad. And um, anyway, he was back there, saw that guy and thanked him dearly for doing that. Yeah. It's pretty cool of that guy. Yeah, a little ballsy. 
<laughs> my dad's not one to take no for an answer anyway <laughs> yeah I think he passed that through the gene pool. I mean he worked in Honduras you know British Honduras which is now called Belize yeah and uh, he showed up there from Scotland Scottish action worked for an American company down there and they said hey we need somebody that can uh, operate a drag line can you operate a drag line he says oh yeah they said great you're hired <laughs> That's before he actually showed up there, obviously. And we almost were raised in uh, British Honduras. Oh, wow. If things had worked out, my dad was making lots of money. He had no, no idea how to drive a drag line. <laughs> <laughs> Learned how to do it on the job. Yeah. And then got pretty good at it, I guess. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so that's my dad. Yeah. <clears throat> Always chased the money. Not that he was money hungry, but he just wanted to improve yeah. Uh, you know, standard of life for him and his family. Yeah. You know, six children. It's a big family for a British, you know, for a British family. And so, and we never wanted for anything. Yeah. And so. <laughs> yeah. No, he was fun to know. He lived to 96. I knew him the vast majority of my life. Yeah. So. Yeah. His grandfather was. You know, my grandfather was uh, was quite different than my dad. Yeah. Yeah, he never smiled, never laughed. Never. I mean, it was... Uh, and so my great-grandfather was a wealthy man up in Scotland, and he lost it all because uh, he became an alcoholic. Yeah. And so a lot of that stuff was passed down to my grandfather... And uh, he was not a businessman, and he eventually lost it all. Yeah. But, uh, but he would never drink. I remember going to his, uh, I think it was a diamond anniversary, marriage anniversary. 60 years he'd been married, and we went back up to Scotland for this big to-do. All of his sons were there. Everybody drank. I mean, everybody in Scotland drank. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, they tried to convince my grandfather, I remember this to this day, one drink is not going to hurt. This is a big occasion. We need to toast. He would not put anything, he would not put a, any alcohol to his lips. That's unheard of in Scotland. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I had to admire him for that. He stuck to his guns. And he was pressured by his sons and people that were there and it was a big to do mm -hmm. there was a lot of people there how old did he live to oh boy he passed away shortly after we came to the united states i remember my dad getting that phone call actually uh i bet you that late late 80s 90 but that's just a total guess yeah and so he lived. He liked to walk everywhere. You know, I mean, we people walk over in Great Britain a lot anyway. And uh, we drop him off in this town that was probably uh, mm, probably six, seven miles away from where we lived. We'd go down there to go shopping. He would. He was living with us for a period of time. He said, oh, "I'll just start off walking." And you knew he was going to beat you there because he would take off walking. <laughs> His big thing was going to beat us there after we did our shopping and take the car back. Yeah. And it was like, where's Grandpa? He should be here. He should be here. He's two, three miles further ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where we get it from. I'm going to be the first one there. <laughs> <laughs> competitive. Yeah. Yeah, super competitive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um so kind of going back to, you know, you working at Wandor, I mean, a lot of people in Utah and throughout the country a little bit know Wandor. They're the accordion door. They're in a lot of the uh, LDS churches. Yeah, they are. So is that what you were primarily doing when you were there? Is it all church work? Yeah. In fact, if they didn't have uh, the church work, I think that was a huge portion of their business. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking 70 75 percent of their business yeah and they uh you know which uh, the church would not stand for nowadays because they don't want any companies to rely on them 
so they can make a, you know, not put anybody out of uh, business if they've changed the direction that they were going. But back then, looking at that, having all your eggs basically in one basket is uh, not good. Yeah. But I was a good worker for them. They liked me. And um, and they were amazed at, uh, at my drawing capabilities. Yeah. Usually when you love something, you're good at it, right? Yeah. You love basketball, you, you're pretty good. <laughs> Most of the time, anyway. And I, uh, I love drafting. And I was paid well. And, um, and so it was, uh, it was a great start uh, for me. You know, bought a brand new car and, and uh, you know, it was good. Yeah. Life was good. And you, so you, you drew and did engineering, but you also went on site and installed sometimes as well, right? Um, n- very, only in one occasion. Oh. We had, um, um, we had a job in Greensboro, Carolina, and it was a, the biggest door they've ever done with a, a whole big track. And this, uh, it was a um, convention center. And this uh, door was probably, uh, uh, I don't want to over exaggerate it, but probably 12 foot high, 200 feet long and uh, it parted in the middle and um, my boss was uh, a son-in-law to the owner of the company in my opinion they ruined that guy they put him in positions that he was not able to handle so he would get these terrific migraine headaches and uh, I think which were real but he uh, he was supposed to go field measure that job to make sure everything was okay. He got sick at the very end, so they sent me. You know, I was probably 22. Yeah. I had kind of a Beatles haircut. <laughs> 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 Stuck me on a plane, and I flew, I flew over there, checked it all out, and realized that um, they were putting, they were installing all the steel work, the I-beams and everything, to support this massive door. And uh, without going into great detail, I could see that uh, the way we had designed uh, the, to attach to those steel, that steel wasn't going to work. I mean, it was like, because it was so wide, um, it was a bipod door, so they, they started at each end and, and then closed. And uh, it was kind of a funny, uh, kind of a funny situation, really that they would even send me. Yeah. But I realized we needed to redesign the door. So when I got back, uh, I you know, came up with another, you know, another design, and, um, which I knew would work, and drew it all up and submitted it to the architect for his approval, and, um, which all had to happen pretty quick. So we get, when they're putting the steel up, we needed to get in there. Yeah. And so uh, my friend was also, he was a little older than me, but he was also a young guy, uh, relatively young. He was over production. He'd worked there for a while with me, and they put him over production. And so, uh, so him and I collaborated on this new design. I mean, um, I did all the cut sheets and everything, but he was the one that was actually manufacturing uh, what needed to be done. Yeah. So this is the first of their kind. All of a sudden, uh, none of the installers wanted to do this job. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. So my friend, his name was Garth Cannon, and uh, he was uh, he was tall. He was six foot seven, and um, and. Uh, they approached us and said, we need you to go. And we said, I said, being a draftsman, you know every intricate detail because everything is drawn up. But I'd never installed a job before. Luckily, Garth had installed. But most, most curtains, the biggest curtains, were maybe uh, 12 feet high and uh, 20 feet wide. 
uh, to give you the scope of this. This was a whole different track system, whole different everything. And so, you know, we we jumped on a plane. I'd already been there. I'd, uh, when I was there, I thought, you know, the best way to do this is to see if I couldn't find a forklift that could raise these panels up, but it would also shift side to side. I had some experience with that over in England with that. So I got a hold of a company over there and lined it up for our installers. And uh, so we got back there. I'll never forget it. We, we walked into there and they just finished up a dog convention. <laughs> there was a million flies. <laughs> in this place and they were cleaning up all the the dog poop and what had you yeah. <laughs> it was horrible just flies everywhere and they didn't last long they when they cleaned it up the flies left but unbeknownst to my friend Garth and, and me the uh, uh, the people at the convention center called Wondor Corporation and said, what are you doing sending a couple of kids over here uh, to do this job? And they said, well, they know what they're doing, you know. Of course, we didn't have to account to anybody. And what are you going to do when you're out of town? So we got there early in the morning. We'd leave reasonably late at night. I mean, we weren't going to like 10 o'clock at night, but... And uh, we had a million of these bolts that had nuts that needed to be put on. And after the first few hours, we thought, this is screwy for us to be doing this. So we hired a kid from SOS. And all he did is sit down, grab a bolt, put these nuts on and lock washers on. And we gave him one as a sample and said, don't move that. That's the one you got to go by. So all he did all day long for like two, three days is put these nuts and lock washers on these bolts. And Garth and I went to town. And uh, we didn't know it, but they were watching us. We never saw those guys. We were just, just slapping this stuff up. And uh, so after a week, again, we didn't know. They called headquarters back here in Salt Lake City and talked to you know, the owner of the company said, these two guys are great workers. They are unbelievable. They're here all day long. They don't take breaks. They just keep going. Well, we would break for lunch. We can't, you know. I mean, what are you going to do when you're out of town? Right. <laughs> we knew nobody, <laughs> and uh, obviously. And, and so anyway, we came down to the very last thing, and they had an engineering firm uh, make what they call the stabilizer. It's the system for the lead post that that would connect and it would keep the front of the door perfectly parallel. So when it came together, that they would match. And uh, so it was the last thing. We pulled these things out and they were made totally wrong. And he never checked them in this double track. This track was this deep. It was massive. And we had a set of rollers here and a set of rollers here, every opposite one. So when they came back to stack, it would stack compactly one set of rollers over the top of the other one, basically. And so we go to put this on, and it wasn't even close to fitting. So then we looked up, you know, the guys and said, uh, hey, do you have a machine shop here? And they said, yeah, we do, but it's, uh, I can't remember if it was a Friday night. It took us two weeks to install this job. Anyway, um, we, <laughs> he said, we have a machine shop here. I said, you have a lathe and a milling machine and a drill press and that kind of stuff? He said, we do, but the guy that runs that's not here. I said, well, I, I know all that stuff. I know how to run all that stuff, yeah. like I told you earlier. And so uh, they said, hey, they opened the machine shop for us. We went in there and we, we re rebuilt all of this stuff and, you know, worked perfectly, stuck that on. And, uh, and um, that was the last thing we had to do. 
And so we did all of that and uh, rebuilt it all. And uh, these guys, after that, thought that we walked on water. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, anyway, they just uh, they watched it to make sure that, you know, we knew what we were doing there. And then they just left us to it. And so anyway, uh, we rebuilt all of that. <clears throat> and so this door was so heavy that... Um, you start the motor and it would pull these back, the whole door, it would pull it back together. And I was upsetting the limit switches and Goff was down there telling me, hey, you know, you've got to come another three feet. And so what we realized is that the motor and the gearbox was so big, when you were pulling all that weight of the two doors together, and uh, you could set the limit switch so that they would match up. It was like a U-shaped extrusion with a lead post that would fit into it so you couldn't see through it. And um, we quickly found out, so we pulled it all the way, set the limit switch, then we'd go open it, you know, maybe 10 feet, come back, and it would smash together. And we quickly realized that now we're only taking very lightweight, 10 feet of door, so it would glide. And so uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't complete the job 100%, which drove Goff and I crazy. We took pride in our work, and he was a great guy. And uh, he was great to go traveling with, because I'd go up to the desk and say, hey, can we have the seats where the exit is? over the wings they say why I said look at that guy over there he's six foot seven <laughs> he's head and shoulders above everybody yeah. oh okay yeah sure we'll give you the seats <laughs> and anyway <clears throat> so Goff and I uh, we called back to the company and said hey uh, you've got to put an electric brake on that. And they said, what's that? <laughs> we said, well, when you turn the power off to the motor, instead of it continuing, there's, uh, when you turn the power off, then this brake would, there's a special motor, would have a, it would uh, immediately be like a disc brake and stop that motor so it wouldn't yeah. travel. And so um, they they called us up and said, hey, there's another job we want. We'd been out there for two weeks. We were anxious to get home. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we want you to fly into Washington, D.C. There's another job. We have a dealer there that is kind of an unusual job. Can you check it out on the way home? Of course, you don't say no. And so we did that, and then we flew home, and we came home, and we were the heroes. No idea. We had no idea, and... Uh, there was, a, uh, there was a club downtown in Salt Lake. I can't remember the name of it. So the owner was a member of this. Basically, I think it was a business club. And, uh, and so uh, they said, uh, we'd like you and Goff to come to this club. And uh, we're going to give you dinner. And uh, they basically was, uh, it was unbelievable how they treated us, actually. I showed up to the club without a tie, and and uh, the owner met me at the door and says, uh, hey, you got to have a tie. I said, you didn't tell me. I didn't bring one with me. He says, uh, and a jacket. You have to wear a jacket into this club. And I don't even own a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I did own a suit, but I didn't own a jacket. He said, well, hold on a second. So he went and found a tie and a jacket so I could enter the place, and Goff was there, and they... Then we heard the story of them telling him, calling and saying, why have you sent these two kids out? And, and, uh, and they gave us a huge bonus each. I mean, it was like $500, which was a ton of money back in. When would that have been? Like 73 or something like that. Yeah. 72, it's 1973. $500 was a lot of money. Yeah. They gave each of us $500. They also gave us cash to take there. And I said, hey, I've got this cash that you gave me. Keep it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember how much we had left over, but, yeah. you know. 
So that's the only job I installed. That's a long story for the oh, little awesome. answer. That's awesome. I like <laughs> the uh, I like the culture aspect of that story because uh, you know one of the things our family's known for is the company you started, which is ADP Lemco. Yeah. And uh, you know, hearing that story, it's obviously not the first time I've heard that story, but I, uh, it's it's indicative of how the our company currently is, uh, you know, that I run. And so, yeah. kind of get into the next part of our conversation is tell us what it was like to start your own business. <laughs> well, I was naive enough to think that I could do better than, uh, than my boss. So I'll give you a little background on how I started that. So one door corporation, the uh, president of that company, uh, left and he got some backing from another company here in Salt Lake city. Uh, to fund him. And, um, and so uh, he actually got into that and he was making some little dumb things. But he wanted to compete with Wondor. So he, uh, so I was working at Wondor and um, he would have me do drawings on the side uh, so I'd go home and I had my own little drafting table at home and I'd do these drawings for him. Anyway, uh, I was doing that on a basis and, um, uh, and he was bidding another manufacturer of the accordion, the accordion doors and, um, against one door. And so he became the enemy really fast. And so it was kind of secret that I was, you know, I was doing this for him. So anyway, it's kind of an interesting story. I was getting married, got married in December. And um, so not only did I invite, um, you know, people at work to come to my wedding reception, but I invited my, uh, the guy that, that was the president, his name was Claire Wright really charismatic, charismatic uh, man. And he obviously liked me, and he treated me really well. I liked him. And um, so anyway, I had some drawings that I needed to give him, so I brought him to the wedding reception, and uh, Claire came in, and uh, I, I said, hey, I've got those drawings, and so I had them in a tube, and I gave them to him, and then all of the one door owners and uh, it was a small company one door was a small company and uh, uh, they all came to the wedding and they saw each other well the guy that was i was at that particular time i became the head of the engineering department if you can believe it you know geez i got married when i was 23 so <laughs> you know i was pretty young for that position um but the guy that uh that company would hire people, uh, people that work for the church. If if they retired, uh, they would hire them, or kids of people that work for the church because that was the main business. They'd hire them. They hired one of those kids that was underneath me. His name was Chris something. Anyway, I guess he wanted my position. So after that, I went on my honeymoon, right? So I was gone for a week. And, um, but we didn't leave right away. And so I went down to Wolf Sporting is Good. Um, and we bought a cooler. And, uh, and so one of my other friends uh, came to me and said, hey, just want to let you know all hell is broken loose at work. And uh, Chris has told them that you work for Claire Wright on the side. Well, unbeknownst to me, Claire Wright was getting a lot of bids. And uh, I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know this till a little bit later. But <laughs> he was funny because, um, you know, you put your bid together for a particular job and then you submit it to like a general contractors that were bidding on the job just like it is now. And uh, at the last minute, Claire would call Wondor Corporation up and said, hey, I haven't got your bed. 
from such and such a company. Where's your bed? So they would give him the bed over the phone. <laughs> so he knew what their bed was and he'd cut them, undercut them by 10 bucks and get the job. <laughs> <laughs> and so they thought there was an inside guy oh, yeah. that was giving them the beds. When they found out that I was doing drawings for Claire, they looked at me. Yeah. And so I went on my honeymoon and kind of wondering what was going to happen. And uh, so I came back from my honeymoon, and they called me right into the office. Said, I understand you're working with Claire. And I said, I am. <clears throat> I'm doing some drawings for him on the side. And they never asked me directly if I was feeding him those beds, because I never saw the beds anyway. It was a whole different department. And uh, I never had access to it. I wasn't roaming around their office, peeking over the corners or anything. I wasn't doing it. And they said, well, look, you've got a, a bonus sitting on your desk. If you take that bonus, we know that you're staying with us. If you don't take that bonus, then uh, we know that you're leaving. You know, jobs weren't that easy to come by, uh, especially Pacific jobs like that. And I'd work my way up the company, and I was pissed. I was like, I work for you and earned that bonus, and so now you're not going to give me it. So I got, as soon as I had an opportunity, I called Claire right up, and I said, are you ready to hire me? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I think I'm going to get fired here because I'm not picking up that dang bonus. And, yeah. and so anyway, I left that bonus on my desk. I came back to work the next day, and they called me into the office. CM picked up your bonus. I said, no. I'm going to go uh, work for Claire Ryan. I'll give you my two weeks' notice. And they said, uh, they kind of badmouthed Claire a little bit. And uh, part of the stuff that they were saying were true, which was part of his downfall in the end. And because um, I didn't pay attention to that, I just thought it was just bad blood. And uh, they said, you know what, you've earned this bonus. Here's your bonus. And I gave him my two weeks notice. And that was it. Then you went to work for Claire? Went to work for Claire. How long did that last? <clears throat> Nine years. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a long time. Um, so I, um, I mean, basically, there was him and me. He didn't know how to install these doors that he was doing. And so he sent me out to do it with a couple of, a guy that he was in business with and his son. They didn't even know how to put a screw in a wall with a powered driver. I mean, they were just drills with a bed on the end back in those days. Yeah. So they sent the three of us up to uh, a place called St. Helens, Oregon, and then we went up to uh, Seattle area, and we had no idea. We didn't have the right equipment, and these things came in 1,200-pound boxes. To cut a long story story, we couldn't even move them around the building. We couldn't even stand them up. They were heavy. Anyway, figured a way up, and we did it, and I came home the hero again uh, from doing that kind of stuff. And uh, Claire treated me really well. And uh, that business grew a little bit. And my first day on the job, uh, he said, hey, I'm leaving for Pasadena to go down to the Rose Bowl. Is that over the Christmas holidays? Yeah, I think it's on uh, New Year's New Year's, Day. yeah. And so it was around that time, he said, here's a stack of files. <laughs> and then he says, I need shop drawings done on these basketball backstops. And he had uh, uh, was representing a company out of Vancouver, Washington, which is just across the Columbia River from Oregon. Vancouver, Washington, not Canada, but yeah. British Columbia. But anyway... He represented that company. 
and uh, but he needed to submit all these shop drawings. I knew nothing about basketball backstops. He said, I'll see you in a week. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> I've got this stack of files. I knew not the first thing about a basketball backstop. Yeah. So anyway, I got my hands on some competitors' drawings somehow and kind of worked my way through that. And uh, and then I, I I learned it. Yeah, got thrown in the deep end and had to swim. Right. Yeah, that's what actually happened to me. And I became. Uh, and then he bought a line. Um, it's kind of a long story, but basically there was a company here that uh, manufactured basketball backstops. They sold it to that Brunswick company. They didn't know what they were doing with it, and they basically uh, gave it back to this company here in Salt Lake. And Claire bought that line from them for next to nothing. And so not only was I now the draftsman, but I was designing the basketball backstops. Yeah. And Claire took the contracts that he had with this company uh, out of Vancouver, Washington, and converted him to his own, which thoroughly pissed them off. Yeah. Rightly so. And so they hated. That company was called Alpine Manufacturing, mm -hmm. a clear ride on. And so anyway, I became the designer of the basketball backstops, which were pretty, nothing like they became to be. Yeah. They were all double pole units. Wall mounted was more common than ceiling and its uh, things. So anyway, um, anyway, Cause that kind of I got into the basketball backstop, yeah. and uh, I mean, we had this compact fold that was amazing. It would fold up in a very tight space. No other company in the world had this. Yeah. And uh, we actually, we actually got that, that with was, that with was the system. ADP Lemco, though. Or was no, the co the compact fold was uh, kind of a uh, a complicated affair. Yeah, uh, with a double pole unit, which was kind of old old fashioned nowadays, but not at the time. Um, but it had all kinds of springs and all kinds of things to make it click into place. But it was kind of unique in the industry. And uh, so anyway, after nine years, Claire went out of business. Companies would not, uh, uh, companies would not uh, allow him any credit whatsoever. And so uh, he didn't have enough cash in the bank, I'm assuming. And... Uh, so he closed it down. And so uh, I had a friend that was a manufacturer's rep, and I went over to Chicago to apply for a position over there. I look at him back at that, and I didn't tell him how good I was. I thought that was bragging, but I should have told him all the experiences that, they, that I had, but they offered me the job. In the meantime, I went to Claire and said, uh, you're just going to walk away from this? Let me take the contracts on. And uh, so I went to the bank. And um, I was living at Bountiful when I was working for One Door. He had his operation in Lehigh. And so I was commuting all the way down. And then, But Claire convinced me that Highland was the place to go to. And so uh, I built a house in Highland. That's how we ended up in Utah County. Right. Because uh, it was a long way to travel, you know, from Bountiful down there. So anyway, I, um, I went to the bank, and uh, it was Bank of American Fork. They just sold out recently. And um, got to know that, that bank manager and... Uh, he, um, I put my, hooked my house up, took out a uh, loan against the equity on my home, which was about 80 grand. 
sticking your neck on the on the block. And I knew basketball backstops in Dornau. I had a reputation with the architects locally. And Claire only really bid in Utah, very south end of, uh, of Idaho, and very, very little in Colorado. Well, my experience with Wondo Corporation is that you could get a microfish on any, it was very expensive, but you could get microfish, which had all the plans on it, which the engineering department would look at to bid on jobs all around the country. Claire never could afford that. And so one of the first things I did is got a hold of that company. And it was, it was very, very expensive. But uh, I bought that, and I started bidding jobs all over the country. <laughs> so we, instead of being just a little local company, we were bidding jobs mainly, mainly in the West, but we got into the Midwest a little bit which drove our competitors crazy. There's no way they can compete with me. Yeah. I mean, they all had dealers. So they had their company, their manufacturing plants, regional representatives that would go around, fly around and see all of their dealers. And uh, so they had this huge overhead. I had four people in the office. <laughs> <laughs> four people in the plant. And... Um, that's how we started. When you first started, did you just do backstops only? Only backstops. So what was the next product line you added? I added a, um, I, I added a, um, a thing for the LDS Church, actually, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They had the gymnasiums in all of their buildings, especially in North America. And, uh, but on Sunday, that was a waste of space. I mean, they'd heat it, they'd air condition it, but there was, there was, it was too noisy in there, you know, to have classrooms. So I, uh, I designed this. Uh, actually, I did that with Claire, now I think about it. I designed these, uh, this system that would fold against the wall, and it was acoustically rated, so it would absorb sound. And so basically it would fold out from the wall and you could set them in series and build classrooms, which made all the sense in the world. You had lighting. Um, we put a chalkboard on one of the walls and they'd fold up nice and neat against the wall and not interfere with the basketball backstop, volleyball, wherever they were playing in there. Yeah. And so I was building those. And so um, that was a good business. And uh, they were building, at that particular time, the LDS Church were building, uh, you know, 360 buildings, <laughs> or 350 buildings a year, one a week. Yeah. And um, anyway. Yeah. So, so I was actually you, manufacturing that also. So when you, how old were you when you started ADP? Uh, 32. 1984. What was the hardest part? The hardest part? I knew the business inside and out. The hardest part was um, some of the hardest things I had to go through was uh, government regulations. We got audited by the state of Utah, and they wanted the tax on the stuff that we, they were selling. I wasn't, I was a little young and a little dumb when it came to that kind of stuff. And we didn't install in California, and, uh, and California wanted this tax. So I got sued by the state of California. And uh, I got a lawyer in Sacramento that was unbelievable. Never met the guy. Yeah. One of the principals of the firm, he went to bat for, for me. But, but anyway, that was some of the difficult things because I wasn't strong enough to say to Utah, screw you, this is not tangible 
personal property. You cannot take a backstop down and put it in another facility. You've got this all wrong. Yeah. I would just listen to them and say, oh, okay, they got me. So I'd pay here. And so we had a... So working with the government agencies and the taxes, and I mean, you've got state taxes, um, you've got city taxes. Roy, Utah, of all places, has a city tax. How are you going to know all these things to bid the job? So my biggest problem was the government. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, not being, you know, bold enough or strong enough to go to them and say, hey, you know, we're going about this all wrong. I can't be paying taxes, same tax, sales tax in both, you know, in both areas. And so, um, you know, then I had to go around and I had to go around and get um, um licenses uh, and uh, you know in each state so I'd have to go there and uh, luckily there were companies that would prep you to take the licenses in each state and they were really good and so I, I, I passed those with flying colors so I would go there maybe three days or two days before and those licenses are general contractor licenses so we can install. Yeah, some of them are not general contractors. Some of them are more Pacific, con, uh, Pacific. like a, I don't think it's a general contractor. And it was more of a Pacific thing. Yeah, like in Utah. Today. I think it was a carpenter's license, actually, originally oh. in uh, California. Nevada was uh, a specialties contact, contractor. It wasn't a general contractor. Yeah. And so... Um, that was a little nerve wracking, but uh, these companies are good to prep you. And so uh, after the first one, the first one I did was in California because we were doing a lot of business in California. They wouldn't let us bid there. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, we went around and, uh, and got those things. Uh, that would take me away from the office for a few days. I always felt like I needed to be there. I didn't. But I felt like I needed to be the first one there in the morning and the last one to close up at night. And uh, the first guy that I hired um, was Scott Robbins. He was a young man, and he was a draftsman, and he was a great kid. And I was in California taking that license. I got a phone call stating that he had... They found out that he had cancer and he's got three months to live. And, and you know, it takes a long time. It takes six months minimum to uh, to hire somebody and teach them what they needed to do. And in the draftsman situation, it takes a little longer than that. He was with me for, you know, a few years. And uh, that kind of broke my heart. He actually ended up living... Uh, he had a rare lung disease that only older people got. And I hired him. He was 21 years old. And uh, he got married and had a, had a child. Mm -hmm. Eventually had two children. But he couldn't work towards the end. And, uh, and I, I, was paying, I was paying for his uh, health care. And I couldn't very well jerk that away from him. And, but it was expensive. And so I wasn't getting any production out of him, but I was paying for his, you know, his health care, which he obviously needed. Yeah. And um, that was a sad situation. Yeah, I think I actually went to school with his daughter. She was my age, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, let me think about that. I think it, I don't think it was his daughter. I think it was a relative. Oh, it was a relative? Out of Alpine, yeah. Oh, okay. It might have been her sister or his brother married uh, a girl up in Alpine. You went to school with her. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, no, I and think so, uh, working in a small business, you know, I mean, ADP is still considered small employee count wise. I mean, you, right. you get to know your employees and they're, 
you know, we were talking in the car over here. It's like, yeah, I mean, sometimes when you're the, the, the boss now, you wake up every day and think, oh man, I'm responsible for a whole bunch of people. And you know, there's, there's an emotional toll that pays. And yeah. And so, yeah, especially when you're real young and starting out. Yeah. You know, and there was, uh, you know, there were some difficult times. I When I first started, I didn't even have somebody to collect the money. Yeah. People would just pay you when they were supposed to pay you. That quickly changed. <laughs> I was going to say, it doesn't work like that anymore. No, you've got to go after that money, and you've got to be on top of it. And so, uh, you know, I had to hire people just to collect the money that they owed us. And why aren't you paying for us? And, you know, and then you learn to know... G- certain contractors that you never want to bid to. Yeah. At first, I needed to bid every job and get every job. But then we got to a point where, you know, screw you, I'm not working with you, you don't pay. Yeah. That's actually how I got into another thing that I manufactured for the church is that this guy up in Idaho was making this uh, kind of the same concept as me, but they were called these butterfly panels. They were made in a V so they wouldn't tip over. And, um, and, uh, but he was, at that particular time, we were doing so well, I bought another company called Lemco. And, uh, and, uh, they manufactured marker boards, chalk boards, and all that kind of stuff. So he was buying chalk boards from me, but he wasn't paying. He wasn't paying, and he was, you know, driving me crazy. So I went up to the church headquarters and said, there's no way you're getting these things on time. He said, no, he's way behind because I wouldn't sell him any more chalkboards. And we were the only manufacturer around. And I knew, you know, I said, hey, I'd like to bid you on these things. And they said, oh, we're open to a bid. So... I started building those, which was great because they had their budget at the end of the year, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, uh, and so people would want to use their budget up. So they were, that was the slow time of the year for us through the winter months. And so they wanted to use their budget up by the end of the year, so they were buying these things like crazy at the end of the year. Yeah. He couldn't produce them up there but he was still manufacturing them. I wouldn't sell him chalkboards anymore. So uh, I was producing all of these things until they decided to pull the plug on that. Luckily enough, I had learned as a young man not to put all my eggs in one basket. So we were, you know, uh, the LDS church business has always been a small percentage of our uh, overall business. So when they pulled the plug on that, it hurt me in a way because nobody were finishing schools and recs at the end of the year. They had to have them ready for September. So through the summer months and everything was our busy time of year because they were completing schools and, you know, recreation facilities, you know, during that time of the year. So that, that really hurt a little bit, but it didn't. It wasn't going to put us under or anything. It just hurt. <clears throat> yeah. I think one thing people don't realize about the construction industry, unless they're in it, you know, cause we're basically considered a subcontractor. Yeah. And so, um, when you, when you do a job, you bid it, it could be two, three years before you actually do it. So getting a sale is much different. You know, you, you actually take the sale and book it, it becomes a booking. And yeah. then in two years from now, you buy all the material ship it all there you install it all there they sign off on it saying that you did a good job which can take weeks and (laughs) then you put a pay application in and then uh they pay you whenever they feel like it (laughs) they normally pay you 45 to 60 days later and so when you're in construction you need to understand that you know cash is insanely important yes it is it's uh, it's kind of interesting because you are bidding you know jobs uh you know, jobs are getting bigger now and they take longer to build. Uh, when I first started, it was about a year for a school. Oh. Yeah. You know, then it grew into two years and now, I mean, we, you and I have been to monster buildings yeah. down in Texas 
look like colleges in their high schools with two swimming pools and four gyms. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we just did a job in Utah um, with Westland, and it's a five-year build. Oh, is it's it? Tear down and rebuild, tear down and rebuild. Oh, but it's uh-huh. a, the total process is five years. And so and in this economy, or any economy, you've got to anticipate cost increases over five years. Yeah. And, you know, if you were doing that in 2019, 2020, and 21 would beat you down. Yeah. So... Well, we went through some hard times. I mean, uh, the government here in the U.S. sometimes, maybe all times, pretty stupid. We got people in there that don't even know how to run a business, never made a payroll. They're running a country. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. And so we went through a deal where, uh, you know, Japan was subsidizing their steel coming to the U.S., absolutely subsidizing them with a greater plan that uh, the U.S., I mean, Trump would have caught on to that in a heartbeat. Yeah. But uh, so they were basically, their steel was cheaper than local steel in Pittsburgh. And, you know, we had a steel plant here in, uh, in Orem, Utah. They shut down a lot of those plants. As soon as they shut down those plants, and they were out of business for good, then the price quadrupled for steel. Yeah. And my bids had already been out, locked in bids, and now I'm paying four times the amount for steel than what I bid it at. So we had our lumps along the way, and uh, so I have my own opinion on who should be running the country. <laughs> and it's not somebody that's been in politics their whole life. Yeah. It needs to be somebody that understands the global yeah. impact and you know, that type of thing. And that's one of the things we're experiencing right now, you know, supply and demand all over the place. I mean, exactly. Yeah. We could talk for the four hours, all the craziness, but yeah. yeah. But in our business, you know, construction is, you know, it's heavily dependent on getting materials and, and uh, I know last year, doors, for some weird reason, were just impossible to get for schools, so they couldn't, which is a major problem, because then you can't dry in a school, which is when you, you know, prevent the weather from coming in. Right. So, but when you were, you know, um, when you were running the business, um, what was the best part of running the business? Um, well, you think you're free when you're the when you're the owner of a business, it's actually opposite of that, at least in my mindset. Um, It was difficult for me to take a vacation. Um, uh, So I'd have to book ahead of time. And there was something you couldn't unbook, so I was actually forcing myself to take a week's vacation, take my family because I'd lose it if I didn't use it. Mm -hmm. The good part about it is you've got your own destiny in your own hands. See, when we started building basketball backstop, we started off completely different than other basketball backstop manufacturers. Every other basketball backstop manufacturer would sell to a dealer. That dealer would put his markup on and go and install the job. We were completely different. First thing that I did is basketball backstop manufacturers would buy glass backboards from a glass backboard manufacturer. They'd buy their motors from a motor manufacturer. You know, we made our own motor. We made our own glass backboards. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we came pretty innovative with some of the things that we did. And, uh, and we could change quickly. They couldn't, yeah. but they couldn't compete with us because they got two markups. We would bid direct. We'd send our installers, and our installers, all they would do is install basketball backstops. So they got very good efficient. at it, yeah. efficient. Dealers would send a crew out of four people to do a gymnasium, take them two weeks because they'd pay them by the hour. Yeah. I learned um, piecework really early in life, like we talked about at the beginning of this, Um, and saw the value in that piecework. And so we would pay 
our installers on jobs that they would do, but they were responsible to go back at their own cost if it wasn't done right. Yeah. And so, for instance, an LDS church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, they'd have two backstops most of the time in their gymnasium. So our guys got paid per the backstop that they installed. The caveat was that they had to stand behind their work. Yeah. And so, um, like I said, they go into a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, two backstops, install those in six hours. A dealer that is installing maybe chalkboards, they were a manufacturer's rep for chalkboards, they would install maybe one or two jobs a year. Yeah. They'd send a crew out, take them two weeks on an LDS job. It would take them two, maybe three days to install. One of the things that we did is we designed the basketball backstops for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They had three or four different buildings, so we knew exactly because we designed it for it. We go to the design it to fit the building. And so it was all pre-made. All they had to do was assemble it. That was, you know, that was different for us. We would always go out and field measure a school or a recreation center when it was time and we would get those accurate dimensions so that when our installers went out to install a job, they never cut a pipe. Yeah. They never did drilling and they never drilled a hole they just assembled other manufacturers would for the superstructure would send a bunch of pipe they'd have to cut it on the job and install it and stuff like that we were way ahead of the curve on that yeah you know plus we were pretty innovative when i got into the business subcontractors were the lowest of the low they were treated like dirt that has kind of changed. The sharper contractors like Westland value their subcontractors. And so they've learned through the years that ADP, they say they're going to be there, they're there, and they are off the job quickly. Now, they've experimented with other companies. That I remember a job uh, close to Eagle Mountain. I think it was in the ranches that we didn't get the bid. Uh, but they're working with a company that doesn't show up when they say they're going to show up. And it takes them forever for them to install it. So they look at the value of their subcontractors like, man, they're in, they come when they say they're going to come, they're through quickly, and they're off the job, and we can put our wood floor in when it's scheduled to put in because you got to schedule those wood floor guys, you know, a year in advance. Oh, yeah. Especially in the West here. You know all about that. Yeah. And so that was one of the biggest problems I had when I first started. I would call the general contract, you ready for us? A lot of them were wall mount units, so we didn't even need to field measure. Yeah. And um, I said, yeah, we're ready for them. The very first job I did was at the point of the mountain here. And they said, yeah, we're ready for you. So we packed up all of our stuff, show up on the job site, didn't even have the roof on the building. So we'd have to haul it all back. Yeah. So then we got very strict with them. Hey, look, are you absolutely ready? Do you have your concrete floor poured? Because sometimes they'll do that last. Do you have your wall up? Is your steel up? Yeah, the steel is up. Is your roof on? No, it's not on. Well, then we can't come field measure it. Yeah. You know, you, uh, but we wouldn't wait for them to call us. We were aggressive. We would call them. How's your building coming along? You know, because it's very important. ADP, Lemco, made its name by doing what they say they would do, which was different than other contractors. And eventually, through the years, I mean, we were lower than whale poop. I mean, they treated you like that, and, uh, you know, you're just scum. And this, you know, you very rarely get a general contractor or a superintendent on a job site that's treating you like that, but they used to treat you like that. Yeah. And you get those old guys, 
That was a job we did in I. Well, it was in Caldwell, Idaho. I remember the job because the guy pissed me off so much. <laughs> and there was two two schools. He was doing the high school. Another guy was doing the general contractor. The guy, excuse me, the other guy was a general contractor for a middle school, smaller school. The guy was a real jerk. On the, on the, he knew everything, and he made life hard for us. Next time around when we bid the job, we said, hey, who's your superintendent on this job? Because if it's this guy, add 15% to our bid. If it's this guy, the bid stands. Because yeah. we didn't need every job at that time, and we could say, Screw you, basically. We're not working with that guy. Yeah. Well, and the real deal with that, too, is they cost you money. He cost us a lot of money. We shipped all of our stuff back there, and he said, you're not, and we were installing the basketball backstubs. He wanted, uh, we wanted to install those safety wall pads at the same time. Efficient. Yeah. We're there. It's a long way away. We're efficient. Yeah. And he rejected that, and he wouldn't even allow us to store the ba- the safety wall pads that we'd shipped up there on the job site. We had to load them back up and bring them back. Yeah. Well, you never forget those things. See? Right. That's been years ago. <laughs> don't tell them how many years. I don't remember. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. He was one of the last of the idiots. Yeah. And we forced those idiots off the job. Yeah. going to cost you 15% more. Yeah. No, it's it's changed a lot over the last ten years. It it has. Yeah. It's changed incredibly. I mean, Westland using them. You know, they basically only use us because the low bid doesn't mean the lowest that they're going to pay. If they're holding the job up and they've got a five thousand dollar a day penalty if they don't get the, the school done in time. It's more the cheapest price isn't the best price. Yeah. I learned that very early on when I started my business. I had a, a bolt nut company here in Salt Lake that was the cheapest price for bolts and nuts, and we used a lot. Yeah. But they could never deliver them to us on time. So I, I said, you know what? Yeah, you go. Price isn't up here. Service is up here. Price is down below. And uh, because if I'm holding a $40,000 job up for six sucking bolts, it ain't worth it. I learned that very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I mean, those are still principles that we have today in the company, absolutely. Yeah. You know, doing our best. So we're yeah. coming up on a hard stop. So we need you to give us your best advice, Dad. The last two minutes. Someone's going to start a business. What's your best advice to them? Someone who's done it all. Hmm. My best advice, and, uh, you know, sometimes you don't follow your best advice. But this is the one thing I would tell anybody. Your gut feeling is more important than anything. If it doesn't feel right, and if you follow your gut feeling, you bid a job that's a huge job, but your gut feeling is this general contractor doesn't work, or any kind of gut feeling, this isn't working out, Get out of it. Your gut feeling, your conscience, whatever you want to call that, if you follow that, you will not fall into some major pitfalls that I have fallen into. Yeah. That's my number one advice. There's a few other things. Don't go into partnership with a relative or anybody <laughs> if you can help it. Yeah. Just don't go into partnerships. Take that money yourself. Don't be dividing that profit with anybody. There you go. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you very much. It's been fun. (laughs) No, it's fun having you on. And, uh, you know, anyone that knows me knows that, uh, you know, our our family legacy and kind of reputation is wrapped up in this company that you built. And now that I'm running it, I I feel the, uh, um, I feel your personality in it. I feel my personality is in it. And, kind of what dictates the culture so it's fun to hear us talk about the business it is you know and we've always been honest we've always been 100% honest yeah that means a lot to me I mean, my children including you 
pretty prideful for the way that they treat other people, their honesty, and uh, their charity that they have. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been fun remembering <laughs> those things. <laughs>